Okay, so welcome everybody. Um, this is a fairly basic talk about creating a disaster recovery plan um, for your database servers and other servers. So if you thought it was something else, now is the time for you to go see um, whether you should use HStore or JSON. Um, the, uh, otherwise, you're in the right place. Um, so, um, people use the term DR um, in disaster recovery um, in a whole variety of ways. Uh, Wikipedia has a rather wordy definition for this, um, for what disaster recovery is. Um, I think it's actually a lot simpler than that, um, which is restoring services after the unexpected happens. What are we going to do to get back up and running after the unexpected happens? And this actually breaks down into an attempt to limit or control two things, which is downtime and data loss. Right? We're trying to minimize, usually, our downtime and our data loss in the event of an unexpected event. Um, so, quick show of hands. Um, how many people here have an actual DR plan for your enterprise or your biggest customer if you're a consultant? OK. And how many of you would measure that DR plan as being relatively complete? OK. And, and out of your, these, this remaining three people, have you actually tested that DR plan? Aha! Well, OK. You're, you're way ahead of everybody else. You probably actually don't need to stay for the rest of the talk. But um, everybody else is more or less in the same boat, <laughs> which is our DR plan is to panic and circulate our resumes. I can't tell you the number of customers that I've gone into where I was like, OK, so how do we get back up and running if your Amazon availability zone goes down? Uh, so that's the general answer. So we end up implementing this for a lot of people. And actually, one of the things, one of the other things that I find is that even for people who have a DR plan, the DR plan is often wrong because they spend a lot of time planning for how to recover from disasters that are extremely unlikely to happen, and no time planning how to recover from disasters that are commonplace. Like a security policy, a DR plan should start with what's essentially a threat model. What are the things that can cause a disaster to happen in, in general class? You are, after all, planning for the unexpected, so you can only plan for classes of events, not for individual events, because if you could plan for a very specific event, then you could prevent it from happening in the first place. Um, so, and then when I start talking to managers about this, they usually want to spend all of their time talking about three kinds of events, right? Server failure, getting hacked. Um, it's very popular for, we have a lot of clients on the web, so getting hacked is popular. And natural disaster, you know? fire, losing the data center, whatever it is, right? This is what they spend, management spends their time thinking about in terms of disaster recovery. And the thing is, they omit a whole bunch of other things that frequently cause disasters and data loss. Storage failure, unexpected traffic spikes, uh, administrative errors, network errors, bad updates, software bugs, that sort of thing. So when I was preparing for this talk, one of the things that I did 
was I went through our email archives for the company and searched out when a client reported to us, particularly the clients who like, the, we, we have an emergency services thing in the company, so the clients who contacted the emergency services thing because of a downtime emergency, um, why they were having the downtime emergency. Um, and three of these items were the most common underlying causes of unexpected downtime or data loss. Any guesses as to which three they were? Admin error. Yeah. <laughs> How about the other two? What? Network failure, software bug. Software bug, software bug. Yeah. OSVM problems. Yeah, OSVM problems. Uh, we're, actually, we're actually pretty common. The, the three actually most common were administrative error, network failure, and actually bad updates particularly firmware updates for the SAM. This was a popular way to lose all of your data. Um, so, um, so you can see that there's a whole sort of discrepancy here because this is what management thinks that they're planning for for disaster recovery and this is what's actually likely to happen. Um, by the way, um, this one right here, network failure, was like out ahead of the others by an order by by like two to one, um, and usually it was network failure compounded by administrative error after the network came back up. Um, so um, now one of the other things that management has problem with is this idea of accepting loss. This is understandable because everybody has a problem with accepting loss, right? That's why we have the whole grieving process, right? You have to take them through, you know, denial and then anger and then, you know, all of those other steps of accepting loss, which is that, um, you know, which is that in the event that a completely unexpected thing happens, you are going to lose some data. You're going to be down, time, down for some period and you're going to lose some data and you just have to decide what's an acceptable level to lose. Um, I, otherwise, you can't make any other realistic decisions. Um, and one of the things that really hasn't helped this situation is this whole nines thing. Um, this is very popular among C-level executives, right? We have three nines uptime, or four nines uptime, or five nines uptime. By the way, this is the how much downtime per year you're allowed for that level of nine-ishness. Um, <laughs> And keep in mind that if you're really trying to adhere to this like five nines uptime, this is how much downtime you're allowed for any purpose at all. Not just unexpected events, but also expected events that require a downtime. And in terms of real disaster recovery planning, this nines model is actually not useful. Um, for one thing, it pretty much makes the assumption that all types of expected events are more or less equivalent. So that is, um, you know, uh, throwing a single hard drive is pretty much equivalent to losing all of Amazon US East because of a forest fire. Um, the, um, the, and it ignores certain kinds of, of types of, of stuff. It also completely does not address data loss. It's strictly about service availability. And I'm like, well, you know, if I'm allowed 100% data loss, then I can give you any number of nines you want. <laughs> The, um, so it's really actually five nines is not about disaster recovery, it's about business continuity, right? What is it that we are promising our customers and we'll have to pay them something if we don't achieve, you know? The, um, and also, at the higher levels of nines, tends to be kind of unrealistic for anybody who has a budget smaller than Google's. Um, the, um, so what model is good? Well, I actually like to use a little disaster recovery planning worksheet. Um, so this is our disaster recovery planning worksheet. And basically what we have is, down the left-hand side, is we have all of the sort of general classes of disaster, of unexpected event that you can have. Um, and uh, there, there are more than this, but this is what I had room for in the slide. Um, so all the different sort of classes of event that you can have. And then, so then we have this one, whoops, whoops, oops, do. Then we have this one downtime column. So this is a, how much downtime are we allowed to have in the event that this, that this event happens, right? So if there's a server failure, 
or a storage failure, for example, how long is the service allowed to be down? Where do we have to target being back up before? And then the second column is data loss, right? If we have a bad update or if we're hacked, how much data are we allowed to lose? Um, you know, because again, here we're talking about mainly database service. So how much of our data, usually measured in minutes, are we allowed to lose if this disaster happens? And the last column that people tend to not, that at least, you know, out of DR worksheets I've only seen on ours, um, is the detection time. That is, um, and this is specifically for certain kinds of disasters, like if getting hacked or administrative error, how long, how much of a window of time do you have to preserve enough information that if you detect that problem, three weeks later you can still recover from it? Um, the, um, you know, because like for example, if I was hacked three weeks, if the web server was hacked and they got into the database three weeks ago and they messed with stuff, do we have to detect it if it happened last month and do we have to recover from it if it happened last month? This is an important question to know because it dramatically affects the amount of backup storage you need, uh, among other things. So anyway, so what I will do is I'll go into a client and say, we want to pay you for disaster recovery and to plan our disaster recovery and help us actually figure all this out. Sometimes we go to the client and say, hey, you really need a disaster recovery plan because we would like you to pay our last invoice. And under current circumstances, you won't be able to. Um, the, um, and so I say, I give them this worksheet and I say, I want you to fill out what the allowable thresholds are. And in that first meeting, the worksheet pretty much inevitably comes back like this. <laughs> because senior management never wants to admit that they might lose data or have downtime under any circumstances. So the way that I deal with this is I give them an estimate of how much that would cost <laughs> to achieve. Um, it's not actually possible for these things to all be zero, but it is possible for them to be near zero. It's just very, very, very expensive. Um, and certainly your 14 employee venture funded startup is, does not have a budget for this. Um, so then after we have the little come to Jesus meeting um, <laughs> about cost, we can generally get a more realistic set of estimates out of them. Um, for each case, right? So if it's just an ordinary server failure, you're allowed five minutes of downtime and one minute of data loss, whereas if the whole network is out, usually with the network being out, for example, because of DNS asynchronicity, you really need to allow at least three hours of service outage because if you actually have to recover from the network failure by moving the addresses of the servers, you're not going to recover faster than your DNS refresh interval. Um, as an example, and this is one of the things you have to explain to people. And you know, going through the list of thresholds. And then once you have all that, that actually gives you the building blocks that you need to make a disaster recovery plan in order to achieve these targets. Now, usually there's several iterations because you come up with a plan to achieve these targets and then an associated set of costs, and that also turns out to be too high. So we adjust the targets again until we come up with something that they can actually live with. Um, and by the way, I'm talking a little bit about cost implementation here, uh, cost estimation here. And that's actually really important. Um, I mean, which is not, there's a lot of technical concerns about disaster recovery. But when you're doing planning for this, cost estimation is important because you're really actually balancing two costs, right? Which is how much does downtime cost me versus how much does not having downtime cost me? And if you're going to, if having downtime costs you $1,000 a minute, and not having downtime costs you a million dollars a minute, then you've got an imbalance in your planning somewhere. Um, also, vice versa. Um, so, and the cost generally breaks down into these four areas. Implementation, maintenance, storage, and other infrastructure. So in terms of implementation and maintenance, these are actually together. It's just that implementation is generally a one-time cost, whereas maintenance is an ongoing cost. And for implementation, we're talking about things like setting up backups and replicas, setting up monitoring, doing the monitoring, doing troubleshooting and responding to monitoring, training personnel in the backup, in the data recovery procedures and everything else, um, and doing recovery tests. 
So this is your implementation and maintenance costs. Those tend to be quite substantial, actually often eclipsing other costs, particularly if you're using consultants for, for all of this work. Um, the, um, the next big cost for any sort of serious data recovery for a database service tends to be storage. Because you have to figure out how much storage you're going to need um, in order to achieve your anti-data loss targets, for example. Like, say we're planning on, uh, we're planning on preventing um, data loss through a comprehensive set of point-in-time recovery backups. Well, then our calculation with a backup scheme for preventing data loss is the number of the backups um, times uh, the data retention period plus one. Um, and you always want that plus one because an unexpected event can happen in the middle of a backup. So if you're required to keep three months of backups, then you'd better have three months in one week. So for example, we had an interesting calculation with a client who had a small data warehouse, about 800 gigabytes, doing point in time recovery backup, um, uncompressed for a variety of technical reasons. And they wanted to, basically in order to meet their downtime targets, and their data retention and their anti-data loss targets, we had to have a year of weekly backup snapshots, which meant we had to have a year plus one week just to make sure we always had a year. And so this adds up to 43 terabytes of storage, which is not insignificant. Um, once we came with this calculation that actually resulted in a change to their backup targets, um, the... Um, so, and that 800 gigabytes plus 20 gigabytes, by the way, it's an 800 gigabyte database snapshot plus about 20 gigabytes in write ahead logs during the week. Then the, uh, then the last thing is your other infrastructure other than storage. So, uh, here you're talking about extra servers that you might need, extra hosting that you might need for backup and recovery resources, and for failover servers. Um, and networking and bandwidth, particularly if you are doing intra-data center disaster recovery where you are doing backups or replication to another data center in a separate location, bandwidth costs are not insignificant and you better estimate them ahead of time. So, um, now all of that cost estimation presupposes that we actually have a DR plan, so let's talk about some of the elements of a DR plan and how to pick them. Um, so your first thing is, your first part element of it is to figure out backups and replicas. Your second part of it is replacements, the third is procedures, and the fourth is people. Um, so now Postgres provides um, a couple of different backup facilities. Um, one is, you know, obviously PG Dump, which is our logical backup facility, and these PG base back, you know, and, um, and then we have our binary backup facilities through PG-based backup or our sync plus PITR or whatever with, with binary backup. And there's the advantages of taking backups um, are you know, several, mostly that um, backups are conceptually simple and you take them at whatever period, you know, once a week, once a month, whatever, and you can, um, depending on the format, and we'll talk about that a little bit, uh, they can be more or less portable. Certainly, it's very easy to move a backup to another data center. Um, and depending on how you've set up your backups, you can recover to last week's good database server or last hour's good database server or whatever, um, which is an advantage of doing backups. The disadvantages of doing backups, the number one disadvantage of your data recovery depending entirely on backups is your, your amount of time required to restore, right? Again, if you have that 800 gigabyte database and you're only doing PG dumps to that database, that is your only recovery mechanism, and you lose the server because the RAID card fries, then you are not making your five minute downtime target, I guarantee you. Um, the other problem is, if you're not doing continuous backup, then you also have a fairly large data loss interval. Now I do know if you have a very small database, you can do PG dumps like every hour, you know, 
or twice an hour and have a small data loss interval. Most people can't do that. Most people are not running on small enough database where that's a practical consideration. So if you're just doing a snapshot or a PG dump, then you're going to have a data loss interval of hours to days, um, which again is not an acceptable target for a lot of enterprises. Um, now, by the way, so PG dump, one of the reasons there's this sort of trade off between PG dump and binary backup that for clients who have really stringent data retention and recovery requirements, ends up that we end up actually doing both PG dump and point in time recovery because of the trade offs between the two of them. So, um, I mean, the advantage of PG dump is it's extremely portable, including across versions and platforms uh, to a degree. Um, I mean, even sometimes downwards to a degree. Because one of, the, one of the unexpected events you have to anticipate for is the client upgraded to 9.3 and they discovered a new 9.3 bug, and now they need to downgrade to 9.2. Um, um, so um, uh, second, you know, PG dumps are a compressed format, um, often up to 20 times smaller than the original database, which means for the same storage cost, you can keep a lot more of them. Um, and if you have some kind of automatically deduplicating storage, you may be able to get even more out of that. Um, but the disadvantage is that they can take a really long time to take the original PG dump if you have a large database, and they can take a really long time to restore, an even longer time to restore, which means that you often don't meet your downtime windows. Um, now, the advantage of a base back, the, uh, with a base backup, you have the disadvantage of generally having a large file size. It's going to be the same size as your database representation on disk. Um, they are to some degree compressible, but not as much as PG dump is. Uh, they're not nearly as portable. You pretty much have to restore them to, you have to restore them to the same major Postgres version. In some cases, you have to restore them to the same patch version or later, if we've actually had a Postgres update release that has fixed something about um, taking base backups and archives. I, they, they do have the advantages, though, that if you have really fast storage, you can, you can run one of, you can do a base backup almost at the full speed of whatever your I.O. is, which is not true with PG dump, um, and restore it at that speed. Um, and we can use this with point time recovery continuous backup. So in general, what we're going to say for backups is, let's get back to our threat model. Right? Because the whole point of this is we are planning for certain known classes of unexpected events. So your backups here, they're good for natural disasters because their portability means that it's easy to ship them to another data center or even into your office um, if that's your we lose the data center strategy. Right? Uh, so the, um, they're really good for administrative error and bad updates, things that might cause direct and permanent deletion of data. Um, software bugs, too, for, for that matter. Um, you know, if you have to downgrade Postgres because you are one of the unlucky users in 9.3. Um, getting hacked for the same reason. Um, again, permanent data loss. Um, they're not so good for other causes of downtime. So let's talk about replication as part of disaster recovery standby. We all know what replication is. Built-in replication, um, despite um, a lot of uh, a verbal abuse that it's received. We still use Sloaning One at a lot of clients um, because they have reasons why that makes sense. Um, even with the binary replication, you have two options, which is full streaming versus I uh, archiving, just wall archiving uh, without streaming. And the reason why you would do non-streaming is again intra-data center stuff, where often um, it's actually cheaper to ship the files or easier to ship the files than to maintain a continuous streaming connection between the two servers. Advantages of replication for disaster recovery, it's continuous. Um, so you are only losing a few minutes to a few seconds of data. Uh, it's fast to fail over, uh, minimizing your downtime window. Um, so you're minimizing both data loss and downtime window for certain kinds of disasters. Your disadvantage is the hardware requirements tend to be much higher than those for just purely static backups, because for things like PG dumps and base backup snapshots and stuff, you can use whatever your cheapest, slowest cold storage is, right? You don't have to um, have a capable database server with 32 cores, et cetera, that's spending all the time running backup. Uh, they're a lot more complex. There's a lot more monitoring and maintenance involved to make sure that they're working. Um, 
there is some burden placed on the master under some circumstances, so there can be performance costs, particularly if you are only doing replication for disaster recovery purposes and not doing replication for any other reason. Um, and most importantly, certain kinds of failures will get replicated over replication. That is, um, drop table users will be faithfully replicated over streaming replication, generally faster than you can react to it and shut down the standby. Um, so for that reason, replication in general. Now, by the way, there is a new feature coming in 9.4, which is time-delayed standbys that can give you a little bit more of a window to react to that kind of a problem. It's the main reason to have time-delayed standbys. Um, but the drawback to that is you're still placing, like um, I was saying to somebody earlier, it can, if the standby is delayed by an hour, it can take more than an hour for your junior DBA to admit that he just did drop table users. Um, hmm? 9.3? No, I'm pretty sure it's 9.4. Anyway. Yeah, so, so replication is good for server storage hardware failures. Your, your basic hardware failures is terrific for that. You can set up automated failover. You can be down for a couple of seconds um, with almost zero data loss. It's bad for administrative error, getting hacked, software bugs, particularly if the software bugs end up being in the replication system itself. So now, in a lot of ways, continuous backup is actually your nice compromise between replication and backup, snapshot backups, right? Is you set up point in time recovery and continuous backup. And that gives you advantages. It's continuous like replication, but you can recover to say before you did drop table users or before somebody hacked in to your database and, and set all, reset all of the admin passwords. Um, I like a regular backup. Um, so in a lot of ways, like if you have a limited budget for disaster recovery and you want a sort of compromise solution, it makes sense to set up continuous backup slash point in time recovery. Um, as your compromise solution. The one way that it is not the best of both is that it can have a fairly long recovery period because you have to restore the snapshot and then restore all of the intermediate transaction logs, which is going to take some significant fraction of the time that it took to create that traffic in the first place. Um, so that doesn't really help your downtime window, but in a lot of ways it, it does you know, sort of compromise both things overall. So now let's talk about replacements, which is our second part here. Now, this is something that even for our clients who actually already have backup and replication set up, they often haven't devoted a lot of thought to, which is, great, you've lost your, you know, you've lost your primary database server, and we have continuous point in time recovery backups on your Dell SAN. So where are we going to restore those backups to? If your, back, if your recovery strategy involves getting on the phone to super micro, <laughs> you're probably not going to make your downtime window. So you need to have a plan for how you're going to restore services from your backup or your replicas in the event that disaster strikes. Um, and this involves having uh, you know, servers, network storage, OS images, uh, all kinds of other things. Now this leads us into part number three, which is procedures, um, uh, which is where you write all of this stuff down. And, and by procedures, I really mean written procedures. Unless, unless you are a company of one person, in which case you can maybe get away without having written procedures. But for anybody else in the world, you need to have written procedures because Three in the morning is not when you want to be making shit up. And unexpected disasters tend to happen at three in the morning. The, um, so, and by procedures, I mean writing down not only every step that you need to take in order to restore services and data, but how to decide which steps to take. This is particularly crucial if the data recovery procedure is going to be carried out by someone other than you. 
Because if the person carrying it out is the on-call network administrator, they don't know what Postgres is or what it does, really. It's a database. It's got stuff. It's on port 5432. That's what they know. <laughs> and so they will be perfectly willing to follow a destructive, let's restore from last week's backup data procedure if that's the first procedure they come across in the company wiki. Even if the only problem was that replication failed and it just needs a restart. So um, this is a sort of truncated example of how you would write out such a set of instructions, right? So first thing is you get a Nagios alert. The database server does not respond. So first, you need to determine if the physical server is down. Write out instructions that someone, someone who is not a Postgres DBA could follow to determine whether or not the physical server is down and whether or not Postgres can be restarted. If in the course of this you determine that it is the network that is down, then it's time for you to turn to the network recovery procedures and stop trying to recover the database server, which is probably perfectly fine. You just can't reach it. Um, then if the physical server is up, then try to restart the database using these commands. Here's how to restart the database. Here's how to determine if the database successfully restarted or not. Um, then if it's still down, fail over to the replica using this procedure. And then this is how to check whether or not the replica failover succeeded. And if the replica failed, then here's where to find the backups and how to restore them. That's the sort of procedure you want to have. Obviously, it would be much longer than this. Um, when I've written this out for clients, it ends up being eight to 10 pages, because you have to do a lot of if-then sort of planning. So your best thing, your sort of good standard is detailed written procedures, like on the wiki or whatever, right? A better one is written procedures that actually have copy and pasteable commands in them, because you can compound a disaster by typoing the restore command rather dramatically, <laughs> which means that really the best is, forget about pasting commands, you have a set of well-tested shell or Perl or Python or whatever scripts that do the various restore steps. Um, and just say, OK, well, if you determine that the server is up and the network is up and the master server can't be restarted, here is the script that does a replica failover and tells you whether or not the replica failover succeeded or not. That's your best solution. So now, the other thing that you actually need to have in here is that there needs to be a fallback procedure if the first procedure didn't work. Because again, you're trying to avoid improvisation and panic. Because what will happen at 3 in the morning is the failover to the replica doesn't succeed, at which point the person at the keyboard starts trying to hack a solution. Um, so you want to have a failback procedure for if the first line recovery feature does not succeed. If restore from backup gives you an error, then do X. Now sometimes do X, we'll get into this in a minute, is call this phone number. Um, if now don't get carried away with this. You probably don't want a fail failback procedure. Um, there are some enterprises where that makes sense. You know, if you're actually doing contracting for the FAA, you probably want a failback failback procedure. Uh, but for most other people, the failback failback is okay. It's time to get the home phone numbers of the manager of this and the senior DBA and everybody else and have an impromptu meeting about what we're going to do. Um, the big thing about this is, and, and I'll emphasize this again, is you do not want to be improvising. Um, we do a lot of corrupt database data recoveries for clients. Um, and I will tell you, in about half of those, it was not the original disaster that caused the database to become corrupt. It was the action that the administrator took after the original disaster occurred. Postgres is pretty good about crash recovery on its own. It is not good about crash recovery if somebody starts copying around and or deleting files after the crash happens. So no improvisation. So our last part of it, um, and one that's often completely neglected, 
um, in various planning things, is the people planning stage, which is you, your, whoever is going to be responding to the unexpected event needs to know who to contact for various kinds of disasters and problems because it's going to be effectively some kind of random person who initially notices that something's wrong. Your first responder, the odds of the first responder being the person who is the most skilled person in the area the disaster actually occurred are low. So you want to have a, you want to have a basic sort of phone tree list that says, um, you know, on-call staff, you know, here's how to contact the on-call sysadmins, here's how to contact, here's our list, right? Here are our database consultants, here are our network consultants, here are our storage consultants, this is how you contact them, you know, this is their emergency line, this is their daytime service contact number, et cetera. Um, if you have vendors that you have 24-hour support from, how to contact them, um, and if stuff has to be authorized because it might cost money, how you can get those authorizations in an emergency. We have had cases where we have been contacted by a client on a Sunday because their database services were down. And we're like, well, we would love to help you, but our contract with you says that we are not allowed any more hours without the explicit authorization of your boss. So we can't help you until you can get your boss to send us a message saying it's okay. Um, and, you know, that's a horrible situation for you to be in. It's a horrible situation for your client to be in. Um, it's a horrible situation for you to be in if you're the admin. So have that authorization information um, available. Now, most companies have all of this information, but what they don't have is have it in one place and one easily accessible place. Um, in the really well-organized shops that I've been in, we had this both on like a company wiki and printed out on paper in a clipboard in the IT office or next to the server room. Because you know what can happen? In the event of a network outage, you know what goes down? The company wiki. <laughs> and we actually had that happen to a client where we were doing a data recovery and I'm like, wait a minute, you have like an unlimited contract with us, why didn't you just call us when this happened? Well, we couldn't find your contact information because the first thing that died was the wiki. <laughs> So you want to include as much contact information as possible, um, particularly since um, it's very hard to keep this information up to date. Um, you know, you put it in a version control system or whatever, you make an effort to keep it up to date, but stuff is still out of date. And if you actually have a website and a couple of phone numbers for a consultant, for example, one of those is more likely to work than if you only have one of them. Um, you know, have copies in more than one place. Do do something to keep it up to date. So then our final thing is that you really need to test your disaster recovery procedures. Now, your minimum is when you create the procedure, do a run through and test it, right? You should at least do that. What's better is to have some sort of regular schedule on which you actually do disaster recovery tests or drills or whatever. Again, most enterprises and shops, four times a year is perfectly adequate. There are places where doing it monthly or weekly makes sense. Um, my, um, Google, for example, has a DR team that does weekly disaster recovery drills. And they have a separate team who comes up with random shit to throw at the DR drill group. Uh, you know, the, um, and what I find actually that works best is that if you can actually make the disaster recovery part of another process that you have to do it all the time, the most common thing that I have to do this is, we use the disaster recovery mechanism to provision staging servers for the QA staff. And that way, we are doing a recovery every week. And if we don't do the recovery, if the recovery fails, the QA staff complain immediately because they don't have a fresh snapshot to do tests on. So that's actually the best because we always know that at least that part of the disaster recovery is working, that we can do it at any time. I mean, most of all, your sort of rule is, if you haven't dis tested any aspect of the disaster recovery, assume it doesn't work. <laughs> so uh, just to finish up, just a couple of notes. Um, uh, a lot of people are like, oh, is that, but what about the cloud? Disaster recovery in the cloud? Well, it doesn't really change things a lot. 
um, people seem to have this weird assumption that the cloud is somehow magically super redundant. Right? It's a cloud. It's automatically redundant. I don't have to do anything, right? Well, not exactly. Um, it's the cloud, I will tell you, you know, that barring uh, an international catastrophic failure of the uh, global electrical grid, AWS will be up, but that doesn't mean that your server instance will be up. Um, and as a matter of fact, on most cloud services, one of the reasons why they're cheaper by the hour than buying a server, um, at least for a single hour, is because they don't have a lot of guarantees of reliability. So now we do come up with cloud hosting, we do come up with some additional issues that you don't really have on standard, um, you know, you own it, you run it servers. Um, instance failure becomes actually a lot more frequent of an occurrence than physical server failure would for physical servers because you're basically combining the kinds of failures you can have with hardware with the kinds of failures you can have with a VM system at scale. Um, the second thing is resource overcommit, where it's not that your instance is down, but that their physical platform is overwhelmed by traffic from someone else that is making your system unavailable. Um, zone failures, um, which uh, a bunch of people in Amazon have experienced. Um, and uh, one of the big ones is that when people start deploying cloud services, they tend to do a lot of DevOps automation. And anytime you have administrative and maintenance at scale, you also have administrative mistakes at scale. You also have administrative mistakes at scale. Um, so um, there are some new tools that cloud hosting that brings to you in order for disaster recovery. Um, one is that there are a lot of redundant services you can take advantage of that can help you achieve your disaster recovery targets. Uh, a second one is the ability to do rapid server deployment in order to assist in the replacement section of your recovery plan. Um, and uh, replicas for doing replication as part of your disaster recovery tend to be a lot cheaper than they would be um, for standard servers. But other than that, Disaster recovery planning for the cloud is pretty much identical to disaster recovering for other kinds of hosting. Uh, some other sort of notes, uh, backup locations. Um, I, so this is, these are more sort of Amazon specific in terms of the cloud because we do an, a lot of consulting on Amazon. Um, the, um, you frequently want to actually do backups to both um, an EBS volume and an S3 volume. Uh, the advantage of EBS is that you can do a very fast failover and provisioning of a new server, um, as in minutes, um, whereas S3 takes a lot longer time to restore from. Uh, but S3 is redundant and guaranteed durable. Um, the S3 storage even survived the famous Amazon East outage, although you couldn't access it for quite a while. Um, so um, one of the things that you actually do, I recommend here is, plan some disaster recovery around rapid deployment. So you do continuous backup to S3, you have AMIs and Puppet, Salt, whatever scripts to do immediate standing up of a bunch of database servers, and then you have a way to recover even to another zone um, from a disaster recovery without necessarily having to keep a bunch of extra idle instances running all the time. So, other tips for DR? Um, have multiple copies of your plan in multiple locations. Um, I've said it before and I'll say it again, a SAN is not a disaster recovery solution. As a matter of fact, a SAN is generally the cause of a lot of disaster recovery exercises. And one form of backup is seldom enough. So, questions? Anyone, I covered absolutely everything? <laughs> I'd be surprised. Yes? Um, just a comment on the written procedures. In my background, I'm originally an experimental high energy particle physics. And uh, couldn't it be that at 2 o'clock in the morning, the light comes on saying you've lost some liquid fuel and cooling to the superconducting magnet and it's about to explode? So something out of the wall or bind it and pull it down. You have no idea what you're doing. Yeah. Step one, step two, step three. 
Absolutely. No. <laughs> but it was a good comment. So any other questions or comments? Do you see people going more extreme with automating some of the VR where it's like, oh, I can't connect to the network and I, or I can't connect to the network and I can't get to the machine. How is you know, Ansible and so automatically start or, or is that something that's happening more and more not VR or is it just scared to do um, yeah, well, no, The thing is the, the tools for automating some of the procedures have gotten a lot better. I mean, from my perspective, that's a good thing, right? If you have a single command that can stand up a new database server and restore it from backup, that's a good thing. On the other hand, you still need that procedure of how do you determine that the original database server is down? Because if you stand up a brand new database server when there was nothing wrong with the original database server and a bunch of the old app servers are still connected to the old database server, then that becomes a bad thing. Um, so. So one of the dangers of automation is that you want to avoid having your disaster recovery procedures become a source of disaster on their own. <laughs> and, and the more complex your tooling is, the more likely that is to happen. Um, in a lot of cases, that just points to the need to have more drills, to say, OK, we have this single command script. Now let's test that it actually does what we think it does, um, which is even more critical when that single command script is actually doing a lot of complicated stuff under the hood. But I mean, like I said, that being said, on the whole, that's a good thing because otherwise, what the user is face, what the admin is facing, is a page-long written procedure of here's how to stand up a new database server. And it is much nicer to say, here's how to stand up a new database server, send Ansible, you know, this and such a command, and then here's how to determine whether it worked or not. And if it didn't work, then see page 34, right? Other questions? Anytime that you have, I, I discussed this in another talk, which I think, I think the stuff from New York is on video, isn't it? I did a whole talk on failover um, in New York. And one of the things I talk about is, yeah, if, if you have a stateful service, which, which you know, a database server inherently is, then you want to make sure that the old master is either down or inaccessible before you stand up a new, uh, a new database server. And, um, and there's two ways to do that. One is to actually take extra steps to physically shut it down, if you can. The problem is that a lot of disasters that would prevent you from reaching that server would also prevent you from doing anything meaningful about shutting it down. Um, and then the second thing is to have a way to isolate that server in a network sense. That is, to make sure that even if it, even if it comes back, nothing can connect to it. Um, the um, so uh, it's your basic it's like I said is like terminate or isolate is what I say so uh, we had another question back here someone raise their hand yeah 
Okay. Um, well, actually, so one of the things that I like, you know, like I said, one of the things I really like doing is figuring out a way to roll that disaster recovery into another procedure. So the way that we end up testing failover at clients is we use the failover as part of an upgrade. Like we need to apply a kernel update to the servers, which happens at least a couple times a year, right? We have to apply a kernel update. So, so what we what we do is. We apply the kernel update to the replica. We restart the replica. If the replica seems OK, then we fail over and make the replica the new master. And that way, we've also tested failover. Do you have strategies for being able to do it more often? Which is like, yeah. we, a couple times a year, it still means that we yeah. might have some misconfiguration that you weren't aware of, and we were running for six months with no PR. No PR. And like, yeah, so if you're going to do it, if you're gonna do it more often than that, um, you know, you either have to have acceptable downtimes, which is generally what you're trying to avoid if you're doing it more often, um, or um, the other way that you can do it is that if you actually have the problem is that you can't test the full procedure without having some kind of an inter interruption. Well, no, because of the way because because the full procedure involves things like failing over the application connections and that sort of thing. Like if you want to test just da database failover in isolation. One of the things you can do is you can stand up the staging application, you know, um, do the do the pr replica promotion and point it at the replica. Um, but really, if you want to test the full procedure, then what you're going to have to do is to say, okay, um, every Thursday night at eleven o'clock, we are going to have this thirty-second service outage, where we do a failover, and then. Then and then you only do the fail you do the failover and then the former replica becomes the new master and then you reverse that the following Thursday, right? Um, and this is assuming that failover is the procedure. It becomes much harder if the procedure that you want to test involves a substantial amount of downtime, like a recovery from point in time recovery archives, right? In that case, you're not going to do the full procedure. What you're going to do is recover from the point in time recovery archives to the new deployment server, right? And then point, say, the staging application at the new deployment server to make sure that it's working, but not take it any further than that. Because taking it any further than that would require a substantial hours long downtime in the real services. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I, I'm not to admit I haven't done a lot in doing more frequent disaster recovery drills because generally I'm in the position of trying to get people to test their disaster recovery at all. Um, so so doing it doing it twice a year would be a big step forward for most of our clients. Um, the um, so uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, one of the other things you can do if you're testing disaster recovery a lot, obviously, is here's the other thing: is to also have have the same disaster recovery procedure available for your staging setup, and then you can run through it on staging. Which allows you to at least catch things like scripting errors um, that would be misconfigured, you know, and that sort of thing. It won't allow you to catch things like the battery, the the RAID card battery being dead, but it does allow you to catch, you know, oh, hey, somebody introduced a bug in the Python failover script. It would be nice if folks could do failover. Yeah. Well, it would be nice if we actually had fail back that didn't require a full 
resync of the files too, but there are technical issues with that. Um, okay, I think we're out of time, yeah? Um, yeah, well, the thing is that if you're going through, I mean, if, we're going, if you're going to a real failover, um, then you need to shut down the primary because otherwise you're risking split brain. But anyway, we're out of time, so I'll have to discuss this later. Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs>